Three, two, one, contact. Oh, just go. Go. It's all good. It says 45 on the clock. Good evening, everybody. Hey, Mike Shower again, Senator from District E down in Juneau, fighting the good fight, doing our thing. Here to give you a little bit of an update. <clears throat> a couple things going on last week. You know the big one when we talked last week about the two bills, or the bill and the constitutional amendment on the elimination of the Binding Caucus, right? So a few more updates. Wanted to uh, circle on a couple things. Uh, tonight, updating, talking about the uh, governor's recall. Going to mention that for a little bit because there's some things happening with this that are pretty significant. And I want to talk our way through that some. Um, so as we go through this, uh, take a look and see. Can you see me okay? I'm just making sure I can kind of see myself on the computer screen. Um, what, is, what is happening with that and where are we at? So let's discuss this as we jump right into things so we don't take too long to go through this. Why is the governor being recalled? Okay, um, I'll tell you flat out what I think is actually happening here. And I've seen this and talked about this since last year. For those that weren't paying attention, the governor's recall started the effort on this and there's some big money behind it there's some families very wealthy families in this state that are behind this as well so don't think there's not just uh, this isn't just grassroots people are doing this there's a lot behind this and there's some people inside this building that are actively working on it too so there's a lot of stake here folks with this is it uh, for cause or is it for policy the answer if you look back to the three things that are mentioned on that and I know some people are going to disagree with that's fine you're free to think whatever you want but it's interesting that I believe it was five days after he dropped his budget, the recall effort started. So you can't tell me, when you consider those three other things that are mentioned inside that recall initiative, that other governors have done those types of things or worse and have never been recalled. This was about the budget. It's nothing but about the budget because you're stepping on toes and pulling money from special interest and others and people are angry. Now, whether you like what he did with the budget or not, it's irrelevant. The point is, we go back to, was it for cause or policy? The governor start, has started talking about that recently, not really for cause, but it's over policy differences. And if that is, is, in fact, the case, and that comes through the court and we see where we end up with this, then we're in really dangerous ground, right? Because instead of removing a governor for cause, something actually illegal, um, you're removing him because you disagree with policy. It's not all that... It's really not unlike what happened to the president. Um, people don't like what he's doing, so they came up with some ideas to try to impeach him. Again, love or hate Trump, doesn't matter. The point is, he was impeached for things that don't really pass the common sense test, which is why I think you saw the Senate, including our senators from here, uh, and our House representatives said, not going to do it. Doesn't pass sense. The common sense test is a partisan act. So I believe what's happening, this really, really ultimately was about policy. It was about the budget. That's kind of what's happening here. So you can see what's going on with the courts this week a little bit, too. It, it would appear that the courts seem to be kind of stacked um, in this particular case uh, to allow this thing to move very quickly. Um, you saw that the uh, defense team for the governor, this isn't about the governor per se, this is just about what's happening, um, has been, uh, they, were, they pulled out, they said they're going to focus their efforts on trying to uh, just... Um, uh, shape public opinion because they don't feel they can get a fair shake in the court and the stacks kind of, and the courts have kind of stacked it up. That's articles that are out there, whatever. So be it. So <clears throat> it leads me into this. Uh, we're talking judicial reform um, because I have had these arguments multiple times um, and I think this is fascinating, absolutely fascinating, that the courts have argued and the court representatives in this very office that somehow the courts being, the, the judges in our judicial system are absolutely unbiased. It's almost as if they're robots and not human. They absolutely do not let their biases seep into their decisions. They can think with a clear head, and they absolutely all the time make perfectly objective decisions. I counter that with, well, does that mean those of us in the legislature, just because we're elected officials, we can't make clear decisions? Because apparently, if I make a judicial reform bill, which I have several, then I'm only doing this for politics, and I cannot think with a clear head, legislators cannot, which some of you are going to laugh and say, of course you can't, I got it. I'm just talking about this as, as a double standard. How come a judge can always think objectively and never let their politics or their world ideology or worldview seep into what they do, but yet everything I do is going to be absolutely tainted by politics? Disagree. You're human beings and they make decisions. And in fact, I've posted some articles recently that talk about some of the leanings of the judicial system and the, the Bar Association. It is what it is. But it's clear when you look at, you know, what they are politically lined up, their affiliation leans to the left. Doesn't mean that they're going to lean left in their court decisions, but it's absolutely true. It's a fact. Those are statistics. So you go back constitutionally to the founding of the state, 
And we have a system set up before, and I've gone through this, and that's why I'm going to mention this SJR 3 I filed last year, Constitutional Amendment. Uh, we had a lot of very heated and interesting debates about that, that uh, Constitutional Amendment in this office and other places, including uh, in judici uh, Judiciary last year. And so here's the thing about it. Right now we have a system set up for one-third of our governmental structure that the ABA, the Alaskan Bar Association, lawyers get to pick, essentially, who's going to sit on the judiciary, who's going to be our judges. So you have about 4,000 lawyers, I think it's more like 2,300 actually actively living in the state, that get to choose from amongst themselves on the judicial council, because the judicial council are the ones that actually get to decide which names are going to go to the governor to be appointed into these judgeships. And the lower courts, it's a little different. The Supreme Court Justice, some others, the chief, they have some say in, in how those are picked. But for the big courts, it really goes through the governor, right? That judicial council is made up of three lawyers, or th you know, three, and three civilians. There's a tie-breaking vote, number seven. Also a lawyer, the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And you have seen through times where there's been a tie, the three civilians voting one way and the lawyers voting another, or the Supreme Court chief justice typically goes with the lawyers. Now, that, that can be done well if you have people that are doing this objectively. However, do you see the problem with the structure and why I filed this bill? What we have right now is a system that lawyers and judges have the ability to choose who ultimately sits in control of our judiciary, one-third of the branch of the government. The analogy is not unlike if legislators had a council and they get to pick and had the tie-breaking vote on who the next legislators got to be. And by the way, they were picking from a pool of everybody that's already been a legislature, you, a legislator. You'd be like, whoa, that doesn't make any sense. But in, in effect, that's what we have. That doesn't mean it's always done wrong. But my point is we have a structure that has very little, and this is important to me as we go back to the silence and the binding caucus of your voice, your voice being silenced, et cetera, and controlled by a few people. We have a structure here where you have really no voice in selecting the judges that sit in the judiciary. Your voice really should come through the ability to go in an up or down vote, and that's essentially what this does. The Judicial Council, those lawyers that sit on that council, what I have done with this one is to say that they have to go through the legislature for an up or down vote. It's not picking who's going to be on the uh, judiciary. It's only the people that sit on the Judicial Council that then pick who's going to sit on the judiciary and go to the governor. I think it's a very reasonable change, and it's a very small change. But it gives the people some voice because their elected representatives actually get to have some say in who's going to ultimately sit on the bench. All right, Senate Bill 200, which we just launched, it uh, talks about how the Constitution allows the legislature to prescribe how appellate judges are appointed. We have that authority already in law granted to us. We've kind of abrogated that responsibility. We don't do it. The judiciary takes care of that themselves. Back to the judiciary kind of having a monopoly on the market of picking who's going to sit on the bench. You kind of like to have a cross-check in there, right? And I agree with the separation of powers, but that separation of powers doesn't mean that people get no voice in the process. There should be a voice to the governor. There should be a voice to the legislature. There should be a voice into the judges. And in some states, they're actually elected. So there's a direct voice to the people right from the get-go. Here, they're appointed first, and then they get into the re-election later on if they decide to sit in the seat. Very different process. Okay? So let's talk about back to the governor's recall circle and back around. Who then must follow the law okay, for cause or policy? Does the legislature have to follow the law? The reality is, no, we don't. Why? We've made ourselves immune to following the law. Other than crimes of moral turpitude, if you get into serious felonies, and obviously you can still get in trouble, basically we've exempted ourselves from having to follow the laws that we write. Okay? But if the legislature doesn't have to follow the law, then why does the governor have to follow the law? Right? You may remember our current governor actually left the majority years ago because of the binding caucus, because he was essentially voting against a budget he didn't think was correct, best for his district and the state, and we got booted. Okay, So we have seen this throughout the history of this state, and I've talked a lot about the binding caucus, so we're not going to go there, but my point is, who has to follow the law out of this? And why is he being held to a different standard than your legislature? And I wonder if the legislators have considered the fact that, ooh, if a court case, a court case comes out, and now... Oh my gosh, the uh, governor is going to be held to a recall because of this policy difference over here, or not following those laws. Does the legislature put itself into the same boat of going, hmm, now we have to follow those or we can be recalled because we're not following the 90-day rule that you people passed out there for us to get out of here in 90 days. We're not following the statute on the PFD, et cetera, et cetera. The courts may have given us a pass, but the reality is, 
is we have exempted ourselves. And we're holding two double standards here. So I am fascinated to see where this goes and what happens because I think what we have potentially done is opened ourselves up as a legislature to go on, uh-oh, um, it's going to be held to this standard. We may have to go to that same standard. This is fascinating. We'll see where this goes. I want to talk a little bit more about the Open Meetings Act because that's a part of it too. Ooh, left it over here. So, oh, sorry, left it over here. Wrong book. <laughs> Back to it. Um, in the Open Meetings Act, remember the legislature has essentially exempted itself. And just a little bit of reading here, and I'll try to go slow enough. Uh, see how we're doing on time. Okay, 10 minutes. Legislators may meet in a closed caucus or in a private informal meeting to discuss or deliberate on political strategy. Those meetings are exempt from the legislative open meetings guidelines, and for purposes, it's got a whole bunch of stuff in here, okay? Talking in section B just above that, for purposes of the legislative open meetings guidelines, a meeting occurs when a majority of the members of a legislative body is present in action, including voting, is taken or could be taken, or if the primary purpose of the meeting is the discussion of legislation or state policy. I want you to consider something here, folks. We, when you talk about the binding caucus, those, we're talking about votes, all right? Things that are being taken inside and who's going to vote for this because they have to, etc. It ties together. In addition to that, when you think about the other things we talk about, do we talk about bills and things? Absolutely we do. That's legislation. So I would tell you right up front, folks, we have issues, we have ethical issues with how we do business here and it's been accepted, okay? So, um, and this is right out of our statutes, by the way. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just telling you what's here, okay? So these are things we need to be considering. We get really, I think, over time... One of the things you see happen is people get comfortably numb. I mentioned this last week and how business is done. And I think we start to think, well, that's just the way we've always done business, so it's okay to do business that way. And I would tell you, no, it's not. Sometimes you have to challenge the status quo. Sometimes you have to go in and say it needs to be done differently than how we're doing business. And if nobody comes in and challenges that, if people just accept that's the way it is, well, then new people come in too, and that's the way they've always done it. Remember what I said last night. I put out a meme out there, and I said, look, understand that this isn't about the person or people or who's in leadership now or in this building. It's not. It's about the policy. It's about the structure. Legislators come and go. They'll be gone. Who's here now may not be here next year, et cetera, et cetera. That always changes. What we should be concerned with is the ethical structure that our, govern, our government can operate under. And if it cannot operate under that, then we need to change it. And that's what this is all about. All of this stuff is about changing the structure to ensure that we have something that is less corruptible hopefully not able to be used or abused, so that we have more ethic and transparency in government. And that's part of what this is about. So let's go on to what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. Because a lot of folks have asked me, what are you doing with everything that's happened? You know, having your committees, all, taking all that kind of stuff, right? What are you up to these days? So we've been busy, very busy. Now, I still have a couple of committees and things we're working on. And a lot of other things we've been working on too, right? So, and we have more to come. But just so that you're aware of what we have been up to right now, People have asked before, and I've said this as part of this aggregate pack package, this total package of how do we solve the problem, because right now we're not solving the state's problems. We're ignoring them and sticking our head in the sand pretty much and just taking the dividend from you to pay for the size of the government. We're not doing anything else to fix it. Okay. One of the things I think is important, but I have it's already filed, and it would be at the top of this list, would be the spending cap in the Constitution. Critical. It is the number one thing. If we are ever going to have stability in this state and durability moving forward, we have to handcuff ourselves from what we spend. We have to, or else nobody is going to want to do business in this state. Every three, four, five years, we go after the oil companies again, and we want more money from them, and things go up and down. Who wants to do business here? So we need to have that in there. But it was already in there. We worked on it last year. It's sitting in Senate Finance right now. Another version of it in the House. And we can move that thing through. And if you do that, I'm willing to look at all these other things. But we're not doing that. So it makes it real hard to talk about taxes or changing the PFD or anything else if we're not going to cap spending. I am not going to throw money, folks, out that window via taxes and your PFD. I am not doing it unless we're going to cap it. I will not support it. I may get rolled, but I'm not going to support it. Okay? I need to see those bounds. How are we going to limit ourselves from spending money? And by the way, as I've said before, we're still talking about cost. It seems like we just stopped talking about reducing the cost of government. We're just going to figure out how to spend money to, or to make, get enough money to spend what we're doing now. That's not an acceptable answer ever. So what have we been up to as I'm off my rant here? My voice is getting fired up again. Okay, so constitutional amendment, um, putting in for a two-year budget. 60 days, 20 days one year to go over um, the budget itself and get it done and nothing else. And 40 days the next year to go over, uh, you know, bills, et cetera, other things that need to happen. Every year if people ask, well, how would you do that without a budget? Well, you can have a supplemental the next year if you need it, if something is happening, et cetera. 
always a relief valve. But imagine, folks, imagine how this place could be if you had a constitutional amendment that actually stopped us from spending crazy amounts and it capped us, and you had a two-year budget, how stable this place could be moving forward. Imagine that. Uh, yeah, and that is, that's correct. It comes from Wyoming. That's the model that we're looking at. We're always trying to model after somebody that's done this so we don't reinvent the wheel and things that have gone through courts like the, uh, the Colorado thing we did for the uh, Eliminating Binding Caucus, right? So constitutional amendment to your budget. Woo, folks, I'm telling you right there, we could make some money on that one. Judicial reform, ethics, talking about that. So you can see we're kind of ethics or cost or the things we're driving out here. I already talked about those, so won't rehash it. We're going to talk, we've got a bill coming out about hiring policy that's uh, filed as well, trying to make sure that um, your legislator's voice is always there, and hence your voice is always there, and it can't be taken away from your legislator, and it can't be used as a political weapon to not allow them to hire the staff that they need to have hired to do the job that they think is best for their district. That's a big deal, okay? Uh, binding caucus elimination, I don't have to go over it, back about ethics again, but we've already filed a bill and a constitutional amendment next week. We may have some more stuff coming because we still have a few things left we're trying to get in before the 4 o'clock deadline this Friday for bills being filed by an individual legislator. And then we have three that are coming out um, that we hope to get done if we can get them all out here. One on education, which we filed last year, but we're pivoting and we're talking about moving. Um, uh, that's true, I can go back to that. I'll, I'll hire back policy, hire policy about coercion too of taking staff away and being, that's that's something that can tie a legislator up in knots. Like I said, much of this comes about ethics and, and what we're trying to fix here, make it better. Uh, back on tap at education, we're trying to pivot this and not talk about, um, I had a bill that was gonna reduce the number of school districts. Instead, we're trying to talk about the consolidation amongst the school districts. Um, and that way you maintain local control, but you can still get efficiencies by having them compact. We're going after um, a model we saw from the Chugat School District to a school district down the Aleutian chain where they were able to compact but keep local control. So we're looking at that one, but that should save us some money, and then we're able to put that back into the goal would be back into the classroom where it belongs, right? The university, you're going to try to get a bill filed out that's going to talk about some decentralization uh, and see if you can give more power to the region so we can actually have that decentralized command and control as opposed to centralized, so we hope that we would be able to reduce cost and allow individual campuses to be able to figure out what classes they need, what courses, accreditation, et cetera. There's, some, there's a long thing about this I'll post as we get to it. And then healthcare, we're gonna to try to get one out as well uh, that talks about how um, patients are put into certain care um, that has been um, basically, for lack of a better word, been abused for some time and it's cost us a lot of money. So you can see that the goal of this office and what we're filing is about ethics reform, making your government more ethical, more transparent, or trying to drive costs down. That's what we're working on here. Most of the bills, folks, there's over 200 in the Senate and way more than that in the House. And it's about, you know, programs and money. And, you know, they're not all bad. There's some good stuff in there, but a lot of it is going to cost us money. And there's very few that are really talking about driving it down. So that's the goal here. So we've been going for 17 minutes now, and I don't want to take, I don't want to extend this. Um, this is your update for tonight, talking about these things. There's more. We may have had a few questions. I don't know. Nothing significant coming up right now. We're trying to make this a little more interactive. Uh, so that if you want to pop on here in the future as you see these, start jumping on during the live and ask questions, and I'll try to answer them as we go to make it a good discussion. Apparently, we do have a question. Will Dunleavy's PFD push for last year make it through, you think? Uh, so the PFD, the saturated PFD was the question. The, the add-on today. That no, absolutely not. I can promise you this right now, folks. I'm already hearing numbers. Of, I've heard them as low as like five, six, seven hundred bucks. Uh, I've heard somewhere around a thousand, eleven hundred bucks. I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, again, I go back to the same thing. I'm not moving off my position. We're following the statute until we change it. If we change it, fine, I'll follow that, whatever it ends up being, but I'm not breaking the statute. I'm just not going to do it. Um, you know, and we'll have that discussion, but like I said, I'm not for taxes or any other changes if we're not going to handcuff our spending first. And right now, the general philosophy in this building is we fund government first. We feed this government. We're not going to make the government smaller. Government's bigger. We're going to take your PFD to do it. Uh, as much as we want and whatever's left, that's what you're going to get. That's basically kind of the philosophy I'm seeing out of this right now. Um, so anyways, there's your answer. That's what I predict. I don't know what it's really going to be, but you know, we'll see here in a few months. That was it. All right, folks, as always, thanks for taking the time to talk to us tonight. We'll find you next week and we've got more topics, lots more coming up. Just pay attention. I appreciate as always you taking the time to be with us on Juno on a Friday or Friday night. Oh, that's a Friday night. I wish it was Friday night. We'll talk to you next week. Have a good night. Cheers.